Introduction to Big Ed During the five years that Edward Hansard operated within Detroit's nefarious drug world, he ranked among the upper echelon of inner city traffickers. The five feet six inches Hansard was known as Big Ed, a name he once claimed to have gotten from the mother of his arch enemy Richard Maserati Rick Carter. From small time crook to big time drug dealer Edward Hansard was born and raised in Detroit's urban area attending Osborne High for a time before dropping out and concentrating on a life of crime. During his early years, Hansard was a small-time marijuana dealer receiving most of his product from childhood associates Richard Carter and Demetrius Holloway. Carter and Holloway would go on to become legendary figures dominating the crack craze which struck Detroit during the late 80s. Big Ed Hansard seeing the success of his childhood associates began making plans to cut himself in for a piece of the pie. By the mid-80s Ed Hansard began making a name for himself selling marijuana while running the unisex salon near Crisella's Jefferson Avenue plant. The small-scale operation provided Hansard with enough capital to purchase two houses in the 13,400 block of Sparling Street which he used to finance the expansion of his own venture into the lucrative crack trade. Shortly thereafter Hansard broke ranks with the powerful ring run by Carter and Holloway and became their prime competition. Big time Big Ed and Ma Maserati Rick Carter, one of the founders of the drug organization known as Best Friends became embroiled in a bitter battle of which the cause is not known for certain. Sources close to both men ascertain that the dispute arose from Hansard's expansion beyond the east side of Detroit into other communities and areas known to have been under the control of Best Friends while others claim that the problem arose from a debt owed to Carter by Hansard. Whatever the cause of the initial depute, it provided provided the spark which lit one of the most violent battles in Detroit's drug world during the 80s. Hansard was known to be something of a hothead whose affinity for guns and violence made him a dangerous foe for Carter who used his vast fortune to assemble a squad of killers which would gain notoriety as one of the most efficient killing machines ever assembled on the east side. Headed by Rock and Reggie Brown, the gang under the name of Best Friends is believed responsible for hundreds of murders in the inner city area area of Detroit during the late 80s into the early 90s. Despite the seemingly long odds of fighting Carter, Holloway and the rest of best friends, Hansard's business flourished to the point where by 1987 he was deemed a major trafficker after LAPD officers spotted him and several associates tooling around the Sunset Strip in a Mercedes 500 SE in a brand new Porsche. When the officers moved in to investigate the young men, they found Hansard in possession of several sets of identification and another new Ferrari in his apartment's parking garage. No charges were brought forth but the episode marked the arrival of Big Ed Hansard as a mover and shaker on a national scale. Following his return to Detroit, Hansard sold Unisex Salon to one of his employees in an effort to hide his holdings in the business. Six months later, Hansard was attacked by Maserati Rick and an associate with automatic weapons. The wounded in the stomach during the attack which left him battered, bruised and stitched for months. Hansard refused to identify Carter as one of his attackers instead choosing to take care of the matter himself. Following the attack, Hansard's longtime girlfriend Stephanie Jacobs purchased a home in Yazoo City, Mississippi on Woodley Avenue. Hansard soon followed arriving with an entourage of hoods driving Jeeps, a Corvette Maserati and several vans. Ed explained the source of his income as coming from from his hair salons back in Detroit. Many of his neighbors found this claim hard to believe considering the armed men who surrounded his home and jumped to fill his slightest request. Many of the men would stay in the home when Hansard would disappear for weeks at a time on business trips. Trouble Edward Hansard managed to avoid getting into big trouble in Yazoo City picking up only a few drunk driving arrests from time to time. Hansard maintained that he was only coming down to Yazoo in an effort to relax. In spite of his notoriety on a national level, Hansard spent almost two years building his organization to the point where he was finally able to compete with Carter and best friends but he would soon find trouble early and often. In February of 1988 Louisiana State Police stopped Hansard driving a GM van and confiscated a gym bag containing one pair of jeans and $198,000 in cash. Ed protested to no avail, the seizure of the cash stayed 
claiming that the money came from the sale of his hair salon. The following month, a Hansard associate by the name of Nathaniel Wilson was threatened after he was arrested with 31 kilos of Hansard's product. Three more arrests would follow, all weapon-related charges during the summer of 1988. During one of the arrests, Big Ed issued the threat of, I am going to get Maserati Rick and then I am going to get you to Officer Rico Hardy. In another arrest, he was overheard stating to Officer Randy Holman, Do you know who I am? I am the number one hitman and dope man in the city. In spite of the threats and boasts, law enforcement officials were forced to watch as Hansard raised bail and walked free after each arrest. Hansard's final entry into the police ledger during the summer of 1988 came when he was stopped in September driving his convertible red Maserati. During this stop more than $3,000 in cash and a beeper were confiscated. Days later, Hansard made his move against Carter attacking the 29-year-old drug lord outside of one of a car, wash owned by Carter at West Seven Mile Road in Mansfield in the northwestern portion of the city. In a gun battle which left Carter hospitalized with a wound in his stomach and Hansard wounded in the arm. Neither man was arrested as each declined to identify the other as the aggressor in the incident. Two days later a man entered room 307 at Mount Carmel Mercy Hospital and pumped several shots into the head and face of the east side cracking. Carter was pronounced dead at 6.01 p.m. just hours after his death. Carter was announced as a pivotal witness in a drug case. Hansard was provided an alibi which protected him from the suspicion that he was responsible for the brazen murder when it was learned he had been picked up at the hospital for possession of a firearm resulting from the shooting which had originally hospitalized his deceased enemy. When questioned about Carter's murder Big Ed denied any knowledge of Maserati Rick's killing but did admit to once throwing a brick through the window of one of Carter's car washes. Hansard drew unwarranted attention following the November 12th disappearance of Carter's best friend and drug partner Demetrius Halloway from a hamburger stand. The disappearance of Halloway turned out to be a staged event aimed at throwing investigators and enemies like Hansard off for a time. Once again detained as a possible witness to the fake abduction, Hansard answer wed, he's just gone, and I heard, he's just in hiding. More trouble Hansard continued his quest to control the city's crack trade and appeared to have achieved his goal when a man later identified as Lodrick Parker approached 32-year-old Demetrius Halloway from behind as he shopped for a pair of socks in the Broadway store at 4 p.m. on October 8, 1990. Parker the prime suspect in the murder of Hallway's partner Maserati Rick had established himself as Hansard's most intimidating enforcer. Witnesses reported seeing Parker and another man enter the parking area before calmly entering the store where Halloway was shot. This murder cleared the way for Hansard to saturate Detroit with his brand of crack known as Tutta Fruity which he secured from major California crack dealers such as the notorious Freeway Ricky Ross. Hansard was conveniently tucked away in jail on gun charges at time of Halloway's murder. Hansard had continued his unlucky streak of run-ins with law enforcement Ray Suling in the confiscation of a 52 pounds bundle of cash locked in a blue Samsonite sweet case which Hansard claimed contained his underwear. Officers who had stopped Big Ed in January of 1990 driving a two-day-old Bronco later found that the cash totaled $369,000 separated into $5,000 increments. Hanser did not protest the seizure of the cash as the proceeds of illicit activity. One month after the seizure of the almost half million dollars Hanser settled his gun charges accepting a probationary sentence and a fine. Several weeks later, the star-crossed Hanser was arrested once more after Detroit police officers chased Big Ed's white BMW after a home near Otter Drive in Gunston was ventilated with automatic weapon fire. The pursuit which Lee wound through the streets of the east side ended when the BMW crashed into three cars. Upon reaching the accident scene, officers found a semi-conscious Hansard laying just outside the open driver's door and inside the vehicle they found an Israeli-made assault rifle and a MAC-10. Investigators later determined that the shots were fired from Hansard's assault rifle. This was quickly followed by yet another arrest after officers witnessed Hansard threaten a man with I will put a hundred holes in 
in your ass. A search of Hansard's car which was parked near the incident which occurred on the corner of Linwood and Richton turned up a Korean made 5.56 mm semi-automatic assault rifle fitted with a 30 round clip. During his life of crime Hansard had been wounded no fewer than nine times in three separate shootings. This crime pay. In spite of the frequent arrests, seizures and shootings Big Ed still managed to turn his dream of running a big time operation into a reality. Investigators figure that Hansard's operation at its peak transported an average of 250 keys of cocaine and another 20 keys of heroin from his suppliers in Los Angeles to through the territory he carved out on the east side and down into Mississippi where he took refuge from the bottles which raged in Detroit. Note, a key is street slang for a kilogram of the drug mentioned which weighs 2.2 pounds. The net worth of the Hansard organization was placed at a conservative dollar $54 million annually. This allowed the then 25-year-old high school dropout to drive around in a fleet of exotic cars, live in plush upscale housing while sending jewelry and $200,000 cash to his elderly grandmother in Mississippi. Hansard was ultimately taken down when Anthony Medina, one of Hansard's California minions, turned and began providing info against Big Ed while attempting to keep his end of the operation going. What was sure to be another bloody chapter in the story of Ed Hansard was averted when he received a three and a half to five year term for his last gun arrests. Hansard was put away for good when on May 9, 1991 he was sentenced to serve a 40 year sentence for drug trafficking and federal gun charges. At the time of his sentencing the 28 year old Hansard lived up to expectations going on one of his famous tirades in which he attacked everyone from the witnesses against him to the judge to the DA and his own attorney. Big Boss Filmworks and Big Boss Books presents Courtney Robert Brown Jr.'s follow-up to the book Motown Mafia. Motown Mafia, big man on campus. Corey Black Jr. is a newly pledged frat member who is in college to make his mother happy and proud that he'll be the first man to go to college in the family. He's also the nephew and son of two of Detroit's most notorious drug kingpins. His father, Corey Black, has fled authorities. His Uncle Joe Black is the reigning figure in the narcotics trade. Uncle Joe has Corey do runs for him to carry on the family business, laundering money and running narcotics. Uncle Joe also owns real estate with Corey's mother, who has a great deal of control in the business. Corey Black Sr. wanted Corey to go to school to bring legitimacy to the family, but Corey had other plans. While in college, with the help of his friends, and his girlfriend. He starts and grows a successful drug operation unbeknownst to Uncle Joe and Tracy. Corey enjoys the most exclusive strip clubs, frat parties, casinos, and women that the city has to offer, all while basking in his newfound popularity. Corey finds himself conflicted with his responsibility to running the family business and his obligation to his college studies. However, he'll have to make things work in his favor if he wants to remain the big man on campus. The names have been changed to protect the guilty and the innocent. 